So Holy God, be with us in the reading of your word that we might hear the truth you speak to us in this new day. Amen. Our first reading for this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 6. We read, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron, and they said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on, your ear, on the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast it in the image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival of the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second scripture comes of from a conversation that Jesus has with Pontius Pilate just before Jesus is crucified. I'm reading from the 18th chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the 33rd verse. Let's listen for God's Word for us. When Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked for him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, for, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. We've been in this conversation about the great ends or the great purposes of the church, a proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship. Our spiritual grandparents have told us that the fourth great end of the church is the preservation of the truth, the preservation of the truth. Jesus stands before Pilate, and Pilate, looking truth in the eyes, he asks, what is truth? How would you answer Pilate's question? George Washington's father had a beloved cherry tree, the story goes, and somehow, somehow it was chopped down, and when young George was confronted about it, he responded, Father, I cannot lie. It was I who chopped down your beloved cherry tree. It's a wonderful story. Most historians believe that it's uh, it's, uh, uh, hypocritical, though. It's not uh, not historically true. In other words, the story we tell to encourage truth-telling isn't historically true. I got to tell you, I have no problem with that at all. But it does raise the question, why would we tell it? Well, a couple of reasons. One is we know that telling the truth is never as easy as we might assume. 
And we also know that telling the truth is the only way that communities can live together. Apart from truth-telling, trust erodes and communities dissolve and fall apart. You've probably experienced this in your own life in some relationship or another. Truth is the ligament that holds communal bodies together from families to nations. In Christian faith, which is rooted in a concern for how we are with the neighbor, that is our first concern, the health of communal life. So it is no surprise that it would be a concern to people of faith, the preservation of the truth. But how do we know the truth? It's 1972. NASA launched a spacecraft, Pioneer 10. A couple of things were different about Pioneer 10. First is that it was the first spacecraft launched with the power to escape our solar system. After about 18 months, Pioneer 10 was sending back pictures of Jupiter, but it kept going. The last time we heard from it was 2003. It's on its way in a trajectory to the Aldebaran star. That's a star in the Taurus constellation. It's going to take two million years to get there, so we're not likely, you and I, to hear from it. But the other unique thing about Pioneer 10 is NASA for the first time prepared for the possibility to communicate with intelligent life beyond our solar system. An aluminum plaque was attached to the spacecraft with messages for whoever or whatever might be out there and intercept it. Of course, it's unlikely that intelligent life beyond the solar system will be fluent in English. So how would you communicate? Is there a language that would be recognized beyond us? NASA thought so. The plaque showed the layout of the solar system, the location of Earth in the Milky Way galaxy, and the structure of the hydrogen atom. Okay, why the atom and the layout of the solar system? As Neil deGrasse Tyson says in his book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, science is a universal language. The laws of science will be true not only on our planet, but throughout the universe. Therefore, if we communicate with that language, it can be understood anywhere in the universe. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? I don't know how you would answer that. But first, we'd have to ask ourselves, how do we decide the truth is true? How do we decide what we believe to be true is true? Theologians and philosophers say that is a question of epistemology. If that's not a common word for you, a simple explanation is it's just that. It's the way we ascertain the truth is true. There are different kinds of epistemologies because there are different kinds of knowledge. There's truth that we know through science. There's also moral truth. There's mathematical truth, and there's truth we claim in faith. These are all knowable subjects, but how we know them, their epistemology varies. For example, I know that 440 vibrations per second produces the pitch of A, and I know that Abraham Lincoln was a great president. I, I know that abide with me is a stunning hymn, and I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the means by which I ascertain the veracity of these different claims are different. So how do we determine what's true in this world? 
Well, for us to talk about that, we have, to, we have to at least, it requires some reflection on the Enlightenment. I know you were thinking, it's the last Sunday in September. Can we at least talk about the Enlightenment a little bit? I know that's what brought you to church. Historians trace the beginning of the Enlightenment to 17th century thinkers like Rene Descartes. You remember Descartes, the one who said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, Descartes not only thought, he and his colleagues actually changed the way that we think, the way that we do determine what's true. Prior to the Enlightenment, the governing epistemology was that truth is determined by tradition, by culture, by wisdom, by those who have gone before, by conviction and belief. But Descartes said, I'm not so sure about that. I think truth, I think the only reliable capital T truth is that which can be known by fact, that which can be discerned through the senses and deduced by reason, that's capital T truth. Capital T truth is that which can be plastered on a spacecraft and recognized as true across the universe. Simply stated, the Enlightenment shifted our epistemology. Capital T truth is no longer determined by tradition or culture, but by facts alone. There's a gift in that. There's also a limit in that. The gift? The Enlightenment taught us to speak of science, of the science of evolution, of creation as an act of evolution. But Enlightenment thinking has its limits because To speak of facts only, you can speak of evolution, but you can't really speak of creation, certainly not creation by a creator, because that leads us beyond that which is factually evident and into that which is bigger than fact. This is my point. We know some things by fact. We know some things by conviction. Two things about that. First, our convictions can't live contrary to fact, but neither can our convictions be confused with fact. One example, Jesus talks to Pilate, and shortly thereafter, He is crucified. Imagine you were there that day and you witnessed it. You saw the crown of thorns, the flogging, the pounding of the nails, the the taunting, and finally his lifeless body. Imagine you saw it all. You would know what happened in this fashion. You would know that he was crucified and what that is like. You would know the facts. But to know that the love of God was redeeming the world is something that is larger than fact, not contrary to fact, but larger than fact and requires a different kind of epistemology because that kind of truth is too big to squeeze down into facts alone. So here's the irony. I spent most of my ministry encouraging you and other congregations to look beyond the simple facts of the biblical story, but to look at what they mean, to look at their significance, not to look contrary to fact, but to, but to look to that which is bigger than fact, to, to discern what the facts mean. But recently, the ground has shifted, and now I find myself I find it important to assert something that for 30 years I thought we all agreed upon, and that is the simple statement that facts matter. The ground has shifted for us, in part because we live in an age where it seems to me, you may see it differently, but it seems to me the freedom of speech is celebrated without any sense of the responsibility of speech. The ground has shifted because increasingly, sources that present themselves as news reporting the fact 
are actually sources that are advocating conviction. And they either can't or choose not to tell the difference between fact and conviction. Facts matter. They never tell the whole story. They never do. But a true story cannot be told without them. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, some of you will remember that former senator. He's famous for having said once, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but, not every, but everyone's not entitled to their own facts. When he said that, it was almost obvious. But I'm not so sure it is anymore. Today, it seems we feel we can create our own facts. Truth that is no, there's truth that is known by fact, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere or the date of the Emancipation Proclamation. And there's truth that's known by conviction that peaches are delicious and that God is love. Uh, all of this is true, it seems to me, but they do not share the same epistemologies. And we need to know the difference. They shouldn't be confused. The truth we know through fact and the truth we know through conviction. But today, more and more seem to believe that whatever they desire, whatever they believe to be true, is just that, truth. The Bible has an old word for that. It's a word we don't use much. It's a word that seems a bit outdated, actually. It's idolatry. We read, we read this story from Exodus, and it's kind of funny, actually. Moses is up the mountain visiting with God, and the people down in the valley, they grow impatient. And so they decide that they, the creatures, will become the creator. They will create God. It sounds a bit ridiculous to us because as much as we might like pretty things, we know there is absolutely no temptation for us to think that something made of gold or stone is worth our worship. We know better than that, and it would be easy for us to say this is a story we can discard as a previous time. But think of the story this way. God is the source of truth. And in God's world, God is the source of truth. And we do not determine the truth, therefore. We do not create truth. We discover it. So to claim that you are making God is actually a metaphor to say we are creating truth. We are creating the narrative of what is real and reliable in God's world. I have decided what is true. I don't discern it. I invent it. It seems that idolatry is an apt metaphor for a lot of what is presented as truth in our day. Several years ago, Time Magazine, on the cover, it said, Is truth dead? It chronicled, it chronicled the list, a long list of public statements that were asserted as fact that had absolutely no basis in fact. Several years ago, the Rand Corporation released a report that was entitled Truth Decay. Michael Rich, president of the Rand Corporation, said, this is to me a dangerous and an unusual time in history because we not only feel entitled to our own opinions, but increasingly, we feel entitled to cherry-pick facts to support our opinion or even dream up facts to support our opinion. Ritz said, when everyone has their own facts, there really aren't any facts at all. I wonder if Pioneer 10 was intercepted by some intelligent life beyond us would they know more about us or would they know certain things about us that we refuse to accept ourselves? Fact seems to no longer be a universal language. If facts don't matter and belief, and belief is, is more important than facts, then it's hard for communities to hold. Here's the, 
Here's the challenge. We don't make a choice here. We don't choose between what we believe is true by conviction and what we know to be true by fact. The issue is how do those two things fit with one another? How do what we know about life and the world factually, how does it fit with what we know by conviction? Because belief matters. There is truth that we know, and there's truth that we believe, and both are important. I believe in my children, I believe in the church, and I believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, but none of which can be demonstrated completely factually alone. I'm fine with that. I'm just not fine with believing that which is contrary to fact. The earth is not flat. The sun does not rotate around you and me. I, I can believe anything. I can believe I'm 35 years old and a scratch golfer, but believing it doesn't make it true. I wasn't even a scratch golfer when I was 35 years old. Truth is not invented, it's discovered. Both facts and belief have currency in our culture, and they should but we should not confuse their epistemologies and thinks that belief and facts are interchangeable. When we do, the center no longer holds. In an age of truth decay, many have assumed that truth can be invented. And they assume that there's no consequence for that, but they're wrong. There are consequences when we ignore truth. When truth is ignored, communities can no longer hold together because trust erodes. You may have known this in your own families. You may have known this in church families. We have seen this is true for nations. Our capacity to be in relationship with one another depends on a measure of trust. That's why we tell the cherry tree story. We tell it because it reminds us that truth holds us together, and it is why truth is so important to Jesus Christ, because He was ultimately concerned about our communal life, about our relationship with one another, and truth is the ligament that holds communal bodies together. Since Christian faith is primarily concerned with how we are with our neighbors, it only follows that we would be a people who would now and always be concerned about the preservation of the truth. It is what holds us together. It requires profound humility because truth is not something we create. It's something we discover. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.